Um, so, Patricia, thank you for doing this. Uh, where and when were you born? I was born in March, in May 23rd, 1996. And that means you're a Gemini, the twins who like to communicate and have a lot of different interests. Do you, do you identify with that? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, what would be three words to describe you for someone who doesn't know you? A tree planter. Determined and compassionate. Mm -hmm. um, do you know how many trees you've planted uh, during your life? Approximately over 5,000 plus. I lost count. Mm. What kind of trees do you plant? Different kinds or mainly? I do both fruit trees and non-fruit trees, and also it depends with the ecological, ecological condition of the area I'm planting the trees, so it varies. Mm. Um, I've read about moringa trees, M-O-R-I-N-G-A, um, that they're really a useful plant, a tree, because they're a food source and they're very sturdy. Have you planted any moringa plants, trees? Okay, no, I've not planted so far. But have you heard good things about them? Yeah, they they are they also have medicinal value in Kenya. For what? What what kind of what do you use them for? Uh, people they say they are good for people with malaria. I've not tried them and they are they they are also associated with curing ulcers, blood pressure and other chronic illness. Oh, but wow. they is they make a promotion of something. Wow. Um where did you grow up uh, in the urban area or the rural area and with how many siblings? I grew up in rural area, and we are six in our family, and I'm the third born. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And were your parents farmers? Yes, I, I grew up from a farming background, but my parents are farmers, and I'm also a farmer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What were the schools like when you went to um, elementary and middle school and high school in, in the rural area? Um, in primary, in Kenya we call them primary, I went to a school in rural, in nearby village. Then I did well. I was admitted in a national school, which is far away from my home in, in another province. Then I did well. I was admitted in a national university. Mm -hmm. And by doing well, is that mainly on national exams? Yeah. <laughs> and when yes, in the national exams, I did well. And then how many children are able to go on? Do you know roughly what percent of Kenyan children are in secondary school? Over 85% of the population. So that's really improved. Yeah. Um, and are there school fees? Uh, uh, on my school fees, my parents used to sell the surplus maize. My parents used to grow maize and they used to exchange the surplus maize as part of my school fees. So I can say I've schooled from Farming. <laughs> um, is it roughly the same number of boys and girls who are able to pass the exams and go on to secondary school and university? Majorly are girls. More girls? Yeah. Ah, why do you think that is? Because based on where I went to in my primary, there were a lot of peer peer influence and abuse of drugs at tender age, so you found most of them, they dropped out. Hmm. Because they wanted to be farmers? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> they wanted to do drugs. Oh, dear. 
And then how how do they pay for those drugs? They do they do they become laborers, they do they do work at the farms which they are paid on daily basis so they get money to do drug. Hmm. And what what is the uh, drug of choice for young people? Pardon? What what drug is available for young people? What what's the most common? We have Mira, the Mira cut. I don't know what that is. Does it make you feel relaxed or speedy or what is it? How does it make people feel? They feel relaxed and yeah, it's. It's majorly done through chewing. It's just like leaves. Ah. And they are done for, we, they are exported from Kenya. Oh boy. Um, yeah. And what about your other siblings? How many of them went on to university like you? Oh, currently three are in university and two in high school. What, what do you think? They, what was there about your parents that uh, encouraged their students to be successful in school? My parents were very strict and my mom was a teacher and a farmer. So she ensured we went to school and we performed. If we failed to perform, they used to punish us. And what, what would punishment be? They used to cane us and sometimes they deny us food. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, and then when you went to, you're in university now, what are you studying? I'm pursuing bachelor's degree in communication and journalism. And why did you decide on that? What, what, was, what motivated you? I was passionate and back in high school I used to participate in drama and music festivals so I had passion mm -hmm. and I used to I loved writing so I thought communication was a right career for me. Mm. And now you're working in a TV station as a journalist as a writer? Yeah. And do you think they'll hire you when you graduate from university? Yeah, I'm certain they will hire me, but I have I, I have other plans because along the way I realized I was so passionate on environmental matters. So after graduating, I'm planning on doing um, my master's on environmental communication. I don't know how soon it, it's going to be, but that's my plan after I graduate. Can you do both? I mean, can you work? for the TV station and do the masters little by little? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I did. Um, so how did you get interested in being an environmental activist? What, what sparked you? Okay, my parents, as I've told you, my parents were farmers and I used to participate in farming, but along the way I started seeing them suffer because of unpredictable weather patterns. They used to invest and the harvest was not good. And I started feeling I needed to work to work for climate. But what really changed me was last year in March, we had the worst drought in Kenya, which affected Turkana. I know you've heard of Turkana. Yeah. And I was among a team which we were we we went to to take donations, and from the experience from the drought, seeing mothers suffering, helpless kids suffer from famine and drought, I had an, an inner conviction to to be the change that the community needed, and I took it upon myself to start and educating the young ones on environmental conservation and taking action. Mm. And so what, what kind of specific actions can people take to deal with drought? Because that's such a huge act of nature. Yeah. What, what, what can farmer, individual people do? 
tree planting, I can say tree planting is the, it's like the major part because due to illegal logging, you find to have the certification and the certification leads to drought and farming. But through planting trees, we try to reclaim back the land. And if we, if you look, we have a lot of benefits that we gain from trees. We have rainfall, we have soil conservation, we have eco-balance. So planting trees summarizes it all. Mm. And who pays for the trees, the, the little seedlings? Nobody. I used to purchase them, but currently I've started working on my nursery. I have a homemade nursery whereby I propagate my seedlings, which I donate to, to students. And we have a new technology of use of seed balls, whereby you cut a seed with charcoal dust, whereby you just plant by throwing the seed ball. Currently, I'm working on seed balls, and I have my own nursery at home, where I have several trees. So you, you have a nursery in the city, or is that back home at your parents' home? Back home in my parents' home. Got it. Um, <laughs> and, and were you inspired by your Nobel Prize winner, who, who got the, the green movement going in Kenya and around the world? Yeah, Wangari Madai is my all-time inspiration, and a spirit works in me, the story of the army bird. And every time I recall, I, I tell people maybe I'm the humming bird she was talking about. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, so the drought last year in 2019 inspired you, and you started making the trees. Are, are you working with... Um, national organizations so that it's not all on your shoulders? Currently I'm working with volunteers but I'm making arrangements to work with the national government because I have a proposal whereby I want them to implement environmental education because in Kenya we do not have anything to do with environmental and agriculture in lower primary. Hmm. And what, what kind of response are you getting from the government ministers? Uh, I wrote proposals. I'm yet, I'm yet to receive the, the, feed, the response. Mm. Um, yeah. It seems like tribal affiliation still plays a role in politics and getting things done in Kenya. Is that true? <laughs> I can say, yeah, at some point, but we'll manage. People know, people know your tribe by your last name, right? Yeah. And so it helps if you're Kikuyu, say. Mm -hmm. Or not? Sometimes it happens like when you want to get something done in the big offices. But lucky enough, we have the devolved government. We are currently we have the counties whereby it's like uh, instead of getting things done in the national government, you can get them at county level. So the to tribalism is currently going down because of the county government. Oh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Um, with when you talk to children in in primary school. What have you found is convincing that they should pay attention to this? And also, what about interaction with wildlife? Because if an elephant is hurting my crops, maybe I don't like elephants anymore. So what, what, what message works for children to educate them? Uh, what message? Okay, when I'm doing my environmental education, I try to to picture them like what will happen 10 years from now if we fail to plant trees. And I try to, to talk with them because I know the cognitive development of child. I try not to instill fear, but I show them the positive side of living in a better and in a better ecosystem. And I also I use the Manila papers, the demonstration whereby I break them, I break the, 
the module so that they can grasp. And I usually divide the pupils based on the grades because the, the smaller kids, their understanding is a bit different from the seniors. So I use, I use figure statistics and also I use real examples by showing them like if like the Australian fires, like last year we had the Australian fires and I showed them the impact we had because some of the rainfall which we, we experienced by towards the end of last year and beginning of this year that was in January was because of the Australian fires which led to Indian Ocean Dipole. So I tried to, to bring a picture. If one forest is lost here, the impact is felt anywhere. And if a tree is planted here, the impact is also felt everywhere. Ah, that's beautiful. Um, and then what's the follow-up? I mean, you can plant a tree, but it has to be weeded and it has to be watered. So who's responsible as you go around the country planting trees? Who's responsible for making sure they make it? Okay, after I visit a school, I usually create an environmental club whereby I elect the leader and the students, they are part of the environmental club. So their duty with the patron or the matron, whereby the teacher, whereby they divide roles on who waters, which tree and when. And after some time, I do a follow-up, I visit school and see the progress of the trees. And I was planning of coming up with a competition whereby all schools that are visited and all trees that are planted, the school which will have taken good care of their trees, they receive a award, but it's on progress. Wonderful. What about schools having vegetable gardens and maybe some chickens? Um, is, is that, is that a, a program that's happening, school gardens? Um, currently, when I was growing up, when I was in class three or grade three, we used to have the, we used to call them for K clubs. They were more of environmental and agricultural clubs whereby we used to plant vegetables. But along the way, they are all dead. Like I can say, only one percent of that program is is moving. And what I'm I'm trying to do is to revive. Through the environmental club, we incorporate agricultural club because we do both fruit trees and non-fruit trees because with the SD, SDGs, there is the partnership whereby we mitigate climate change, we end malnutrition, zero anger, and quality education. So it's like four, four SDGs in one action. Hmm. And do you find that teachers are supportive generally or they feel like oh this is one more responsibility that I already have on my shoulders or generally what what reaction do you get from the teachers the teachers are supposed to because because climate crisis is evidence everybody is experiencing effects of climate crisis so they are supposed to because they know in future they are the one to benefit and if they want to benefit their kids the future generation will benefit from the, from the trees we plant. Mm. Um, yeah. Vegetable gardens are nice because they're fast and you can eat the carrots and eat the tomatoes and eat the corn. So it, 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 it's, it's reinforcement for your actions pretty fast, which is good for kids. Yeah. Um, do all, all this work that you do, is it volunteer or does the government help with your expenses traveling? It's full volunteer and passion. I've not received any grant, anything from the government. I do it from my pockets and from passion. <laughs> oh, and when you are working with other volunteers, um, do you find that there are more women or more men? What's the kind of gender breakdown of the environmental activists you know? Most of them are ladies. They're, they're females, yeah. Like 90% like of them are females. Do you have any idea why? What's happening with the guys? <laughs> <laughs> okay. In Kenya, like... The tradition, the tradition in Kenya, a woman is supposed to provide for the family, 
it's the role of the woman to ensure the kids are fed. And you find 90% of work in the farm is done by women. And when this crisis occur, the burden is left to women to ensure their kids are safe, to ensure their kids are fed, to ensure their kids are protected from floods. So you find the and you know women are vulnerable in society. So you find most of the most of activists are women because everybody wants their kids to have a better life. So we must fight for environment. Mm. Um, is it a problem? Yeah. I know it is in some parts of sub-Saharan Africa that men leave the village, they leave farming so they can make more money, they think, in the city working as laborers or something like that. So the, the women are left doing the farm work. Yeah, it, it's also happening in Kenya. You find people, people the they white-collar jobs, people value white-collar jobs and like farming. That's they leave their the women in the rural and so it's upon the women to to ensure the kids are fed and to ensure they farm. Mm. Um, do you think and, if, and even in, even with the youths in Kenya, you find like ninety fifty percent of youth are unemployed and they have left they have left rural to go and look for white collar jobs without them knowing there's potential back in the rural. Ah, uh, that's a major issue. Yeah. And are are most of those uh, fifty percent who are unemployed in in urban areas are they young men? Or yeah, young they youth. Yeah, but young, but men, males. Mentally, are the males? Yeah, the unemployed in the cities. Mm. Um. Do you think of yourself as a feminist? Yes. <laughs> what everybody is saying yes, it makes me really happy. <laughs> Cuz women used to say, "Oh, I'm not a feminist, but I believe in equality." Hello, that's what feminism is. So but now everybody that I'm talking to is saying, "Yes, I'm a feminist." No buts. Um why do you think your generation, Generation Z, is um, able to be active and make change so young? Because I think earlier generations, people weren't, uh, it was rare to have, well, there's the Children's March during civil rights in the U.S. in the 50s, but mostly people were activists when they were in their 20s or something. So what is there about your generation that enables you to be leaders so young? First, I can say because the current leaders have failed us. What they do, they do lots of talks with less action. So because we want a brighter future, a better tomorrow, so it's upon us to take action and actually to act because if we wait for current leaders to act, what they know is just pocket and pocket and pocket. But the current generation want a better and a brighter future. That's why that's why you find majority of them are taking action. Mm. And what about the effect of social media? Could they have done it? Could you have done it without social media? Did you hear me? No. What what could you have done this? Yeah. Could you have I can't done, hear you. Could, could you have done this without social media? Yeah, I think yes and no, but yes, I could have done because what my work entails is visiting schools and planting trees. But with the social media, you find lots of support. And because social media makes us one, one community, one small village, you find you connect with other activists from other, other countries. You, have, you get to learn other better ways of doing your activism, better ways of doing things. And also you, have, you get to learn different things from websites, from organizations. Yeah, so I think social media has played a major role. Like, like 
we had the earth hour and a lot of environmentalists and activists we were able to connect with each other to celebrate earth hour and with even the fridays for future by greater so you find we know at every friday we are one community we are one family whereby we come and through social media you find our voices are heard better mm. um in terms of fridays for future um are any kenyans actually leaving school and being on the street with their signs and trying to educate people or is it more a social media friday Oh, I can say it's a bit social media Friday, but you find few schools are allowed to to go on strike. You know, in Kenya, it's different from the the US. That's the difference. But you find what in Kenya we are majorly doing. We are doing active Fridays for Future with action. So you find on Fridays is when we plan. <laughs> okay, I heard on Fridays we do an action like plant trees. Yes. Okay. Um, and who else inspires you from other countries besides Greta and Fridays for Future? Who? What other countries do you learn from? Oh, refresh your question. Uh, what other countries do you learn from besides Greta? Uh, I learn from uh, I learn from Lea from Uganda, Kau from Togo. There's from Manessa from Uganda. There's Mulinda from Uganda. Yeah, there is. Elizabeth from Kenya. Oh, there's Alexandra. I can't remember the countries. I have like a list where we have a platform on Twitter whereby we share. Wonderful. Um, is is there kind of a national or international sub-Saharan youth climate activist group? that's sub-Saharan Africa where people can meet in conferences and that kind of thing? Yeah, we have a group which is majorly run on Twitter. Uh, we also have a WhatsApp group. What, what is the name of the group and the subgroup? Global Justice Activist. Mm -hmm. And who started that? Cow, she's cow. The the lady who, who referred you to me and from Togo. Togo. And Togo. Ah, yeah. Got it. Um. And what what have you learned that you would advise other activists? What tactics work? What should you make sure that you do so you're effective? What tactics? So what tactics? What strategies? What organizing works refresh <laughs> i think this we are experiencing poor connectivity yeah um what um if you're giving advice to mm. another activist say one do this Two, do this. Three, don't do this. What advice do you have? Okay, first, do research. Because it's from research. For you to do anything, you must have a background study of why I'm doing this, what the future, research. Be resilient because you'll find, along the way, you'll find negative impact negative energy be resilient and 
the third one, have passion. Because without passion, along the way, you will give up. And what what books or what ideas have been important for you? What books were like, oh, this really taught me a lot? Oh, um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not into books, but I've, what I've learned is uh, an article from UNEP and the UNCCD, United Nations Convention for the Certification. I usually follow their blogs on environmental sub-Saharan and mitigating climate change in sub-Saharan countries. I read most of articles and previous research from from scientists. Mm, mm. Yeah. Um, and what what do you do so you don't burn out? How do, what do you do for fun? For fun. Okay, what I do for fun, I watch movies and I attend my garden. It gives me, it's therapeutic, it gives me, a, you know, that energy. And anytime I feel I'm stressed up, I feel, um, you know, everything is falling apart. I, vi I, vi I visit a park or a forest and, you know, the trees, the breeze, the birds, and I come back to normal. Mm. Um, in the West, yeah. there's a growing problem of teenagers, especially girls, with anxiety and depression. And I'm wondering if that's an issue that you've seen or not. Oh, I can say, yeah, we have a lot of mental illness or mental problems among the youth because of lack of job opportunities, because of frustration, relationships, and poverty. So you find there are the cases of anxiety, people taking their lives, people doing drugs because of anxiety. And what I usually advise my peers, if you feel anxious, if you feel depressed, Take a walk to nature because there's the it's environmental. There's the, the mental aspect in the environment. Once you are out outdoor, you find there's the conviction and your anxiety levels goes down. What What about if if you live in Nairobi? Is, can you find parks and natural places to go to, even if you live in a slum? Oh, we have green spaces in Kenya, which Wangari Mathai Fort 4, we have Uru Park, we have Aboretum, we have Michuki Park. People can take a walk to those green spaces because they are free. And you can walk. Yeah, and there are trees, there's water, natural water, there are birds. It's a normal park and it's free. So you find you find on week on weekends you find Lots of people visiting the parks, enjoying, and the activities like boat riding, you know, the games for kids. Mm -hmm. Some, clim activity. Mm. Some climate activists get trolls online. They have people that insult them and say they're climate change deniers. Have you had that experience with being attacked for your activism or not? Yeah, someone attacked me and I think they used that because I'm black. They told me actually we must continue using fossil fuels or you want your continent Africa to continue using candles, kerosene and stuff. And you find I think racism and cyberbullying is still evident on social media, but you just ignore because if you concentrate on what those people say, you will you'll give up. But I tell them it's it's fine. Let me continue with my work because it's it's out of passion. And there's another point I outlined. There was a massive illegal logging in one of the forests, and when I I alerted it on Twitter, someone was like, ah. Why are you fighting for trees? What do you gain from them? But you know, I told them I'm doing it out of passion and they're trying to pull you down. But you know, if you have facts, no matter, they were saying because it's a blue gum species, which 
which is not should not be planted in wetlands. I told them that does not justify illegal logging, no matter the species, no matter where it's planted, because after they cut down, they do not check the initiative to replace. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, are you overall optimistic or pessimistic that we'll be able to turn climate change around? Because we have people like Bolsonaro in Brazil and Trump in the U.S. who deny and Australia is prime minister who, who who try to pretend climate change isn't happening. But are you an optimist or a pessimist? I'm optimistic. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because I listen to scientists and currently climate crisis is evidence. In Kenya, it's evidence we have unpredictable weather patterns, excessive rainfall, we have drought. And, and does, your, does the Kenyan government at least give lip service, yes, there is a climate problem? Does the Kenyan government do what, pardon? Do they acknowledge that there is a climate change problem? So they yeah, do. they do. Yeah, they do. And currently, the government is working on planting trees to attain the 10% forest cover because currently we are at 7.4, which is below the desired. So, yeah, at least they are acknowledging we have crisis and they are giving farmers alternative on when to plant and what species to plant based on pre weather predictable. So, five years from now, it sounds like you'll be working in media, working on your master's in environmental science, Anything else you see yourself doing five years from now, say? Um, five years from now, I want to push and, and oh, make a proposal whereby climate action should be the, the test for the politician before they are actually nominated. Because if you check the presidential debates and in Kenya, the, the debates, Mentally, the politicians, they, they talk of their manifestos. And ever since I've been listening to their presidential debates, I've never heard any one politician talk of climate action. So I'm working on a proposal where, by in the next five years, it's my zeal to have passed a proposal whereby, before any leader is vetted or is nominated to vie for a presidential seat, they must pass through a body which is either from UNEP, United Nations, Minister of Environment and Forestry, whereby they assure Kenyans of their climate action plans before they are vetted to buy for presidential. Then during presidential debates, they have to explain to the people what climate action plans they have and what plans they, in case of crisis, what plans do they have for both vulnerable and poor people. Mm. Um, have you yeah. thought about being a, becoming a politician yourself? <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't want to be a politician. But I think because of environment, I can be an environmental activist and try to push to ensure politicians keep their promise because they are failing us, and all what they do is talk and talk without action. Right. Uh, what about? preserving um, the, the wild animals, you know, the, the elephants and the, the lions, the big cats seem to be m the most problematic in terms of their interaction with, with farmers. What, is, is there progress being made to, to help them survive? Yeah, the government is ensuring they, they, are, they reduce the conflict between the world and the, the communities through fencing the, the parks and also ensuring they have the game rangers to ensure they do patrols. And currently we have the sensors from the IoT, the Internet of Things, whereby they are able to monitor and track the movement of the wild animals within the park. So if they cross the border, they are able to detect uh, the weird movement. Mm. Are, are elephants and big cats the most problematic for the farmers? 
Yeah, you know, elephants, we have monkeys. Oh, monkeys, yeah. And buffoons. Yeah, you know, they, they can harvest an, an acre of a shamba. And currently, we have the locust innovation in Kenya and in East Africa. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. is, is there anything else that you would like to add about climate change? Or it seems to me that the bottom line in Kenya really is... Um, is poverty and jobs for young people. If, if you were in charge, what would you do to make sure that young people had employment? First, what I will, uh, what I will do is ensure I create more job opportunities in the rural because we have arable land in Kenya. And when we talk of when we talk of agriculture, people think of the, the actual digging, but it's a, it's a bigger topic because you can be in, you can use your technology to assist farmer, maybe coming up with application whereby you link a farmer direct to a customer without the, the brokers. We have the value addition. Maybe the youth can use their knowledge to add value to things like tomatoes through drying them. We also have the chain value. Like I can, if I was able, I could turn the youth back to agriculture and back to rural because there is potential. And every day the population keeps on growing. That means most stomachs need to be fed. And that calls us back to appreciate farmers because we need them three times a day. And if youths go back to the farms, I know they will be employed because you know it's you you get employed, you farm, you sell your produce because every everybody needs food. Right. Uh, smartphones enable rural farmers to bank and connect with customers. So how common is it that people farmers in rural areas have smartphones? A smart phone. Telephone. Smart a telephone. You know, yeah, even with the smartphones in Kenya, electricity as it's not in. You find m most of rural areas they have no electricity, and lack of knowledge. Because I say without lack of knowledge, the farmers are easily manipulated by brokers. So you find even with their telephone, they are not able to get the accurate information. Thereby, a broker comes and ma manipulates them. But with the youth going back to the rural, they can educate the farmers and on how to use their smartphones and give them the reliable information. Um, roughly, what percent of people or families in rural areas have access to a cell phone? There, there's maybe one in a village that you can rent. Is that how it works? Oh, no. I think currently every family, every home has a, a smartphone. You know, they, because they are cheaper currently, yeah. Uh, ah, that can really revolutionize farming because you can bank and talk to potential customers and, as you say, not be relying on the broker. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, um, anything else that, that we haven't talked about that you think is important for people to know? Okay, my part in short, I can say a child without environmental education is a bad is like a bird without feathers and if for us to attain the sustainable development goals we have to change how we raise our kids today because no matter how much we fight and we strike calling upon government leaders to act we have to act by training the kids on sustainability because unless we train them on we train them on importance of having better environment, they will not appreciate it. Right. Got it. Okay. Thank you.